So now we understand a little bit about how the pressure, volume, temperature, and amount of a gas are related to one another. We're going to do some um, calculations now on the amount of gaseous substances in chemical reactions and mixtures. So whenever we're doing um, calculations on the amounts of things in chemistry, these are described as being stoichiometry calculations. So I want to review a, um, a concept, and that is the idea of the molar mass. So molar mass in general chemistry is often given the abbreviation uppercase M and what it means is the number of grams in one mole of a substance and if you want to you can write those units out a couple of ways there it's going to be grams per mole or we can write grams moles to the minus one whatever happens to be the most convenient for us in a particular situation. Another concept that's worth reviewing is the idea of concentration. So concentration is the amount of substance in a given volume. And as you know, um, in the um, SI system, the base unit for the amount of substance is a mole. So it's common to give concentrations in chemistry in what we call molarity. And molarity is the moles, that's going to be our amount, divided by the liters. So we're going to have so many moles of a substance per liter of a solution. So the volume is in liters and the amount is in moles. So molarity is going to have units of moles per liter which can be written as moles liters to the minus one and somewhat confusingly these units are often written as um, an uppercase m substituting for that but you can tell whether the uppercase m is referring to the molar mass or the molarity by the context because this is a label telling you what is being measured it's a unit you only get when these when you see the uppercase m and it's intended as a unit label, it's going to come after a number. When you see an uppercase M and it's intended as an abbreviation for the molar mass, and you know this is going to be in a formula, it's going to be within a formula. So if you see M within a formula, you know, or uppercase M within a formula, you know that they're referring to the molar mass. And if you see uppercase M at the end of a measurement, you know that they're referring to molarity. Okay. So we're not going to talk too much about this in this lecture, but it's just worth putting that out there because we are going to be using that abbreviation uppercase M. Okay, so many times um, in a chemical reaction, we'll get a gaseous reactant or product being involved. So a good example of this is if you've ever taken a um, baking powder, which is a solid, and reacted it with a vinegar, and the um, what you're reacting it with when you do this is um, an aqueous solution of acetic acid. And you probably know this is a classic um, volcano reaction. It generates a whole bunch of carbon dioxide gas, and it kind of bubbles. So we know that from the ideal gas law, we could calculate the number of moles of a reactant or product if we had the pressure, volume, and temperature that the reaction was occurring under. So N equals PVRT can be used to calculate the number of moles of a gaseous reactant or product. Now, what that means for us is now we can start doing stoichiometry calculations just like we were previously doing stoichiometry calculations using the masses in grams but now we can do them for gases where we're going to be putting in pressure volumes and temperatures so here's an example here this is how many grams of sodium chlorate are required to produce 125 liters of oxygen gas at one atmosphere and 20 degrees celsius according to the following reaction. So I want to know how many grams of that stuff I'm going to need to make 125 liters of this. Now this reaction um, is looking like um, it's looking like it's balanced. 
good and so I don't need to worry about balancing it and I can see that my mole ratio is that I'm going to need one mole of sodium chlorate for every one mole of O2. So if I can figure out my moles of O2, I can figure out my moles of sodium chloride because they're just going to be the same. So my number of moles of O2 will be my pressure of O2 times my volume of O2 divided by the ideal gas constant multiplied by the temperature of O2. So I've got some, um, some numbers here. I got one ATM is my pressure. There. My volume is 125 litres and then R 0.0821 litres atmosphere per mole per degree Kelvin and then my temperature is 293.15 Kelvin. So I put all of that into my calculator and see what I get, 125 divided by 0 0.0821 times 293.15. You see how I made certain that my temperature was in um, a Kelvin there. And what this tells me, we're going to be doing everything here, it looks like the three sig figs, is that this 125 litres of O2 is equivalent to 5.19. 37 moles. So this isn't too hard because my sodium chlorate and my um, O2 are in a one to one ratio. Right? One of those um, is derived from one of those reacting. Then that means that I must be reacting 5.1937 moles of NaClO3. Now they don't want to know the number of moles of NaClO3, they want to know the molar mass. Oh, they want to know the number of grams. So what I'll be needing is the molar mass of NaClO3. So I have to add that up. So 22.99 for the sodium plus 35.45 for the chlorine and then I got 3 times 16 for the oxygens. So where that, what that leaves me with is 106.44 grams per mole. So I'm going to calculate the mass of the NaClO3 now. So I just calculated that I get 106 0.44 grams of NaCl3 for every one mole of NaClO3. So that will cancel and that will cancel and that's going to leave, you can see, my grams of NaCl3. So that wasn't too bad, right? not too bad at all. So now we'll just go ahead and calculate that. So I'm just going to take my answer that I got before, 106.44, that I still have in my calculator, and I'm going to go multiply 5.1937, and what I ended up with was 553 grams of NaClO3. And I am, I'm only doing multiplication here, so I carried it through a few few through a few digits more than three and then I just um, give my final answer to three digits at the very end. So you know at every point in here I just carry through one or two extra digits and then I um, know I'm going to be um, okay as far as not having any rounding error. Okay pretty simple there we used molar mass yeah and we used our n equals pv on rt so not too difficult not too difficult, you get the idea. Now, um, we can also um, combine other equations with the ideal gas law. And so something to remember is that our number of moles is equal to our mass divided by our molar mass. 
And so in chemistry, we normally use a lowercase m for the mass in grams. And then we've already mentioned this, we use an uppercase m to indicate the molar mass. So one thing that we can do is you see where we've got this n in the ideal gas law is we can replace that with little m on big M. And so when we do that, we get this guy. Now, okay, we have another formula from um, week one that said that the density is equal to our mass divided by our volume. And so if we look in here, we can see that we have both our mass and our volume. So we should be able to kind of like reorganize this um, expression that we've got here to get the expression for the density of a gas. And so that's what I'm doing here. So I'm, I'm going to divide both sides to and by V to begin with. And there you go, you can see I've got M on V or little m on V at that point. So I kind of did it. And now I've just got to bring everything over to the side where P is over to the left hand side. And when I do that, I end up with this, that the density is equal to the pressure times the molar mass on RT. So this is kind of an interesting um, expression. What does it tell us? Well, what it tells you is a couple of things. It tells you that the density goes up as the pressure goes up, and that's not surprising because as you push your particles closer together, your substance is going to become more dense. It also tells you that the density goes up as the molar mass goes up. Now that's cool because what that means is that for a given gas, as its molar mass goes up, even if you keep the, or for a gas, as the molar mass goes up, even if you keep P and T the same, the density will go up. So that's cool. So gases with a small molar mass have a low density. And then the next thing it's gonna tell you is that as the, the density goes up, as the temperature goes down, so hot gases are less dense than um, cold gases. So that's kind of cool. So as you heat a gas up, it becomes less dense. As you cool a gas down, it becomes more dense. So this is a key expression here. Density is equal to P times the molar mass on RT. Okay, so here's our expression. What is it telling you? The two big things that it's really telling you is that density is inversely proportional to the temperature in Kelvin. So as temperature goes up, density goes down and vice versa. And it's also telling you that density is directly proportional to the molar mass. So as the molar mass goes up, the density goes up and vice versa. So if the temperature is fixed and the pressure is fixed, what gas do you think would be the least dense? Well, the least dense gas would be the one that has the smallest molar mass. And the gas that has the smallest molar mass of all gases possible is H2. And it has a molar mass of 2.02 grams per mole there's no gas with a smaller molar mass. Now you might say, what about if we had a gas that was made out of individual hydrogen atoms? Well, we can't have such a gas because as soon as individual hydrogen, hydrogen atoms collide with one another, they make H2 molecules. So that's not gonna work. So this is the guy that has the least, um, that is the least dense at a given pressure and temperature. So, um, yeah, suddenly it makes sense why you would want to fill a balloon or an airship with hydrogen, right? Because hydrogen has the lowest possible um, molar mass. So it has the lowest possible density at a given pressure and temperature. Now, of course, there is a huge problem. And um, if you follow the links on the uh, PowerPoint slides that I've uploaded, you, there's a couple of videos that illustrate this. H2 gas is super, super combustible, especially when it's mixed with air, it's basically explosive. 
So, um, you know, this isn't the, um, the greatest choice. So the next lightest gas is helium, and that has a molar mass of um, 4.04 grams per mole. So although it's, you know, it's considerably um, higher in molar mass than hydrogen, it's a lot, lot, lot safer, and helium is, the, um, is what we would now choose to fill these airships with. Of course, there is another way that's super um, inexpensive and very safe and doesn't rely on a specialized gas is you can see here that as the temperature goes up, the density goes down. We know that if we just have a, this is my bad um, hot air balloon again, if we just have a, um, a balloon where we fill it with air, but then we heat that air up, then the air will become less dense than the surrounding air and the balloon will rise. Okay, so our equation tells us this, right? That the density of a gas is inversely proportional to the temperature, i.e. as we heat a gas, it becomes less dense. And this is why we have hot air balloons, and as you can imagine, hot air balloons are a lot safer than hydrogen balloons, as long as you don't accidentally um, catch, um, set the material that the balloon is made of on fire. Okay. So in this problem, you're asked um, to calculate the molar mass of a gas given its density. So the question reads, a gas has a density of 0 0.650 grams per litre at 25 degrees Celsius and 757 millimetres of mercury. What is the molar mass of the gas? So we know that our formula for density is P M on RT equals density, we want to solve for the molar mass, the uppercase M there. So uppercase M molar mass is going to be equal to DRT on P. Now in this formula, R is equal to the ideal or what we call sometimes the universal gas constant, which has units of 0.0821 liters atmosphere per mole Per degree Kelvin. So what that's really telling us is that our volume needs to be in litres, which is not part of this formula, but our volume here is given in litres, that our pressure needs to be in atmospheres, and that's going to be a bit of a problem because our pressure is actually given in millimetres of mercury, so we're going to have to do a conversion there. Our amount is going to be in um, moles. That'll work out just fine. We'll see that in a moment. And our temperature has to be in Kelvin. And again, that's going to be a little bit of an issue because the stated temperature is in degrees Celsius. So um, what I'm recognizing here is that my temperature, I've got to add 273.15 to it. So that ends up being 298.15 Kelvin. And then my pressure, what I'm going to have to do here is this is going to be 757 on 760 in order to convert it to atmospheres. And when I do that, it ends up being a little under one atmosphere. So what do we get here? It ends up being 0.9961. 0.9961. ATM. So now we're in business, right? And uh, we just got to kind of plug everything in. We've got this term on the top line, which has three um, parts to it. So we've got 0 0.650 grams per liter. And then I'm going to multiply that by 0 0.0821 liters atmospheres per mole per degree Kelvin. And then I have to multiply that by the temperature, which is 298.15 Kelvin. And then that whole thing gets divided by the pressure in atmospheres, 0.9961 atm. So my liters to the minus one cancels out with my liters. My atmospheres cancels out with my atmospheres. Uh, my kelvins cancels out with my kelvins and I end up left with grams per mole. So I got it right. So my molar mass is just going to be 0 
times 0.0821 times 298.15 divide 0.9961. Now, you know, um, this number, whenever you're calculating a molar mass, the important thing to recognize is that it has to be bigger than 2.02. .02. And as long as it's bigger than 2.02, .02, you have a chance of it being okay and in this case it ended up being and we're going to go to three and um, significant figures here 16.0 grams per mole so I'm not going to guess what the gas is there's a variety of options but um, there you are right so and um, that's a good example of doing one of these calculations okay now it gets a little bit weird a lot of the time we'll have a mixture of a gas, a mixture of gases. A good example of this would be air. All right, air has got nitrogen, that's the major component, oxygen, and then it's got other minor components. The probably one of the larger ones of that is helium, but you've probably heard of other gases in air like carbon dioxide and ozone and things like that. Now, if you have a mixture of non-reactive gases like air, the gases behave in a really weird way. They behave as though they were the only gas present. That is, the presence of the oxygen in the atmosphere means doesn't really do anything to how the nitrogen behaves, right? So the most famous example of this is the, um, the phenomenon known as the Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures which says that the total pressure of a mixture of gases is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of the gases. So what do I mean by the partial pressures of the gases? We need to kind of, um, you know, figure that out or otherwise we're just going to be confused. So the partial pressure of a gas is the pressure a gas in a mixture would exert if it was the only gas present. So here's a mixture of gases, right? And the total pressure is 15. This mixture is composed of a mix of gas A and gas B. So if we took a sample of gas A at a pressure of 10, and then we added to it a sample of gas B at a pressure of 5, then the total pressure is just simply the sum of the individual pressures or what we call the partial pressures that's it so in a mixture of gases the total pressure is just equal to the sum of the partial pressures this is expressed mathematically like so and it's referred to as being dalton's law of partial pressures now if you know some notation you can write p total is equal to the sum of the partial pressures right there you go so that's what we're um, talking about here okay so that's a pretty simple idea the the total pressure is just equal to the sum of the partial pressures and the partial pressure is just the pressure that would and um, the gas would have if it was in the container by itself all right so real simple to solve problems of this type so it says the total pressure so p total of a mixture is 754 millimeters of mercury so a little under one atmosphere now what do we know about the total pressure in this mixture of nitrogen oxygen and water vapor is it's going to be equal to the partial pressures of each of those three components all right now it then says the partial pressure of n2 and o2 in the sample are 154 and 320 millimeters of mercury respectively and we're asked to solve what is the partial pressure of water so what do we know p total is equal to p o2 plus p n2 plus p h2o so reorganizing this p total minus p o2 minus p n2 will give me p h2o and I can go ahead and calculate that and it will just be 754 minus PO2 you just got to kind of there we go 154 minus PN2 320 and we'll put all of that together and we're going to get the numbers the number in millimeters of mercury 754 minus 154 
minus 320, boom, and it ends up being 280 millimeters of mercury. So again, fairly straightforward, no real fuss there. Okay, so now we introduce a new concept. We're going to introduce the concept of what we call the mole fraction. It's a pretty simple idea. It's really, all it is, is the fraction of a particular component, but expressed in moles. So the mole fraction of component X is just equal to the moles of X over the total moles in the whole mixture. And that's it. Now, what you want to realize is that the mole fraction of any component in a mixture is always going to be less than one, right? If it is the only thing that is present in the mixture, then it wouldn't be a mixture. But, you know, if it's um, the maximum possible mole fraction is when it is the only thing present, at which point the mole fraction would be one. The other thing to remember is that when you add all the mole fractions together for the different components, they have to add up to one because if it's 0.5 of one component and 0.3 of another component, then it's if there's three components, the last component must have mole fraction 0.2. They have to add up to one. Okay, so keeping those things in mind um, helps us keep our thoughts straight as we're trying to solve these problems. So let's have a look at a problem using the mole fraction and seeing how it um, can affect the um, Dalton's law of partial pressures. So it turns out that the partial pressure of a gas in a mixture is equal to the product of its mole fraction and the total pressure. So the partial pressure of component X will be equal to the mole fraction of component X multiplied by the total pressure. So that's really cool because often we'll be able to measure the total pressure, we'll be able to measure the mole fraction or we know the mole fraction and we would like to know what the partial pressure is of, the, of a particular gas because it's very difficult to measure that directly. Okay, so we've got a bunch of stuff going on there. We've got density is equal to PM on RT which we can reorganize to give an expression for the molar mass. We also um, have reorganized our ideal gas um, law, so we had an expression for the number of moles of a substance, and we can use that when we're um, calculating um, stoichiometry type problems. And then the last thing that we did was we looked at Dalton's law of partial pressures, which says that the total pressure of a mixture of gases is equal to the sum of the partial pressures of the individual components. And the partial pressure of a individual component is equal to its mole fraction times by the total pressure. So this is all very new content um, for you guys. Um, and so, um, you know, it's it's not quite as long as chapter one, but the material is new. So um, keep that in mind as you're reviewing this and applying it to solving problems. Hope the video is helpful. See ya.